you know what the next step was? He had to go and ask his uh, dad if he could use the family car. So his dad brought him into the study and said, uh, son, I have three things that I'd like you to do if uh, you want to use the family car. Uh, number one, you need to bring your grades up. Number two, you need to study your Bible a bit. And number three, you need to get a haircut. A month went by. The young man came back to his dad and said, uh, Dad, can we uh, talk about using the car? Dad brings him into the study again. He says, son, you know, I'm really quite impressed, very proud of you. Your grades have come up. You didn't study your Bible a little, but a lot. But yet you still haven't got a haircut. The young man said, you know, Dad, I've been pondering that as I've been reading the Bible. <laughs> Samson had long hair. And Paul had a Nazarite vow, so he probably had long hair. And then some people even believe Jesus had long hair. Dad says yes, and everywhere they went, they walked. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy for children or anyone to submit to those who are in authority. Yet we see that even Jesus, when he came to the red and white triangular sign, you know which one I'm talking about? The yield sign. That he, if you will, bowed to his God-given authority. Here's a question I have for you, and I hope it causes you a little consternation for a bit. When you yield to God, what will God yield to you? How dare you ask that, right? When you yield to God, what will God yield to you? Luke chapter 2 is where we will find our answer. So would you turn there, please? And as you're turning to Luke chapter 2, let me give you a little background. Last week we studied that it was the time of the Passover. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus had gone to Jerusalem so that they could celebrate the Passover. When Joseph and Mary had left, most likely in a caravan, they found that Jesus wasn't with them. It took a total of three days until they found him. And when they saw him, he was sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And Mary said, you know, your father and I, we were, we were concerned about you. And Jesus asked two questions. Why have you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? That's where we pick it up here. Verse 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you for this account in Luke. It's unique, not found in any other gospel, and yet tells us about how Jesus viewed authority. And Lord, how do we view authority? Are we really under authority, your authority? Are we under the authority of those that you have put over us? And Father, the answer to those questions will make a huge difference whether we will please you or not in our lives. So Father, help each one to sit up today and take note. So to speak, this is where the rubber meets the road. And when we get this issue right, it resolves many others. So, Father, I ask you to address the congregation, each and every heart personally, as only you can. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yield signs have an interesting history. If you go back to uh, 1954, does anyone know what the original colors of the yield sign um, were back then? Anybody know? Yellow and black. Yellow and black. Yellow and black. Now, some of you don't go back that far. Okay. Now, the yield sign that we have seen currently in its red and white form was given to us in 1971. God's yield signs have never changed. What's amazing to me is that Jesus chose, made a decision, to yield to God. 
And he sets an example for all of us. Look at verse 51 with me. It says, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth. The trek from Jerusalem northward to Nazareth would have been 63 miles. But can I ask you a question? Why does the text say since they traveled north that they went down? Let me give you two reasons. Number one, Jerusalem is truly a city on a hill. It's approximately 2,500 feet above sea level. When you're in Jerusalem, and I can tell you, you can see all around when you're still in the ancient city today. The second reason is see if you can pick it up as I read to you Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Listen carefully. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Jerusalem is the king's city. So therefore, whenever you go to Jerusalem, you're going up. And whenever you leave Jerusalem, biblically speaking, you are going down. And it says here in our text, and then Jesus was subject to them. Can you think about that for a moment? Earlier he said, why have you sought me? Did you not know I must be about my father's house or his business? But now he submits to them. Let me give you the verb here, hupotasso. It's used 40 times in the New Testament. And I can tell you this, everybody. What you do with that verb will make all the difference in life, whether you're pleasing to God or not. One word. Hupa means under. Tasso is to arrange. It means to arrange under. It's in the present tense, which says that Jesus kept, if you will, arranging himself under his parents. It's also in the middle voice. And we don't have a middle voice in the English, but the middle voice is when the subject acts upon itself. In other words, Jesus made the choice that he would submit to them. Now, let me give you a principle for life that you need to get your arms around. Submitting to God's authorities is yielding to God. Submitting to God's authorities is yielding to God. It's that simple. Let me give you some examples of how this is used biblically. We find our word in Romans chapter 13 in verse 1, where it says, let every soul, does that give anybody an exception? Let every soul be subject. Hear the word subject, that's hupotasso. Let every soul arrange himself, arrange herself under the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that are exist are appointed by God. Let me illustrate this. You get in your car today, and you're leaving. You come to 42nd and Newton, and there is a stop sign. Have you noticed it? The police always notice when you don't notice, let me tell you. And it's always an embarrassing day, and I've, had it seen, I've seen it a couple of times, where someone's coming to church, and they don't stop, and guess where you get pulled over at? in the church parking lot. Now, you know, if I'm in Maine, I'm in Northern California, if I'm in Colorado, when I get pulled over, chances are nobody is going to see that. But when you're on 42nd and Newton and you're getting pulled over in the church, it's always a bad day. Now, let's just say as you look at the stop sign there, the stop sign is being held up by the mayor of the town. See, because it says there's no authority except from God. So if you will, to blow through the stop sign or do what we used to call the Hollywood stop, that was kind of a rolling move, okay, means to ignore the authority of God. Let me take it a step further. We go out and we're leaving, we come 42nd, we go, you know, around here, we get on Bladensburg Road, and there we come upon a speed limit sign. And this time, as it says, whatever, 30, 35 miles an hour, and I'm sure you know it very well, Instead of the mayor holding a sign, it's the governor. And there's the governor holding it up. Or let's just say, you're, you know, you're, you, you've traveled up from uh, Leesburg or you, you've come down from Frederick, Maryland. You go out and get on a highway. And I get excited on a highway because it says 65. And my cruise control can get it on 65. But this time holding up the sign 
is not just the mayor, not just the governor, but it's the entire Congress and the President of the United States. It's a large sign. Now, I want you to envision this every time you see a stop sign, every time you see a speed limit sign, every time you're out on the roads, I want you to see that God's holding that sign. And every time we disobey what it says on that sign, whether we're not yielding or stopping, or we're choosing to go over the speed limit, okay, choosing, we are dishonoring our God because he says there's no authority except from me. And one of the tests in life is how do you do with government authorities? How do you do when you have to have a licensed daycare and you don't have one? What is it teaching everybody around you? What is it like when you have employees on your payroll and you're slipping the money under the table? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's what? The things that are God's? And oh, we have all the reasons to justify it, but let me just tell you something. You're communicating rebellion. And we wonder why it goes from one generation to the next generation. You know why it happens so often? Because the older generation has taught the younger generation, and it keeps going on. There is no authority except from God. That's what the Bible says. So we need to arrange ourselves under our God-given authorities. Let's talk about the family for just a moment. God has placed a man as the head of the home. Think about this. When Adam and Eve sinned, is it Eve's sin that gets passed down from generation to generation, is it? It's Adam's sin. Why? Because he was a representative. He was our, our federal head. He was the one, if you will, that the buck stopped with him. So now he has a great responsibility, the head of the home, because God is going to hold the head of the home very accountable because we have to give governance to the rest of the family. But then the rest of the family needs to submit to the appropriate authorities. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? What does it say about wives? Listen carefully. Ephesians 5.22, wives submit. Hoopa, tasso. Arrange yourselves under your own husbands, but notice what it says, as to the Lord. So when the wife is submitting to the husband, to whom is she ultimately submitting? God. Okay. Makes it a little bit easier. When you have an authority and you're struggling to submit, now listen to me, we always submit to the degree until they tell us to disobey God. The minute somebody says to me, okay, pastor, you can preach, but just don't tell anybody that Jesus Christ died for the sin of the world and was raised from the dead. No government official can stop me from doing that. Why? Because it's my God-given authority. And when the apostles were told not to preach in Acts 5, 29, he said, uh, -uh. we ought to obey God rather than men. Get the order right. But then it goes on to say, wise, and see, this is the test, because you know who's watching? The children. And when the wife isn't submitting to the husband, guess what the children are learning? Rebellion. Ephesians 5 and verse 24 says this. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let your wives be subject to their own husbands. And it doesn't say in some things. What does it say? In everything. You notice the men knew all that. Yeah. In everything. Okay. And by the way, that becomes a test. You can find out whether your children are going to please God or not. Because when you ask them to do something, and they might tell you, oh, I want to please you, Mom. I want to please you, Dad. But then when you give them a direction and they don't do it, don't listen to the words. Watch the actions. Because the actions will tell you that they really don't love you to the degree that they tell you they are. Because if they did, they would obey what you're giving them to do. The connection. Children. Ephesians chapter 6. Why is this so important? And I'll tell you why. This is a monumentally important thing. Because I watch. I've been in a pastorate. But I was an associate pastor. I served as a deacon. I served as a Sunday school teacher. 
I got to learn an awful lot about authority and church people. And you know what? Sometimes church people can be the most non-submissive people on planet Earth. And how do you know if they are? What do they say about the leadership? You want to know someone's heart, listen to what they do with authority. Think about this for a moment, if you will. In the book of Jude, even Michael the archangel, pretty high angel, pretty powerful, yeah. Even when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, dared not bring a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. See, Michael understood that Satan had certain authority and he didn't revile him. And guess when you attack the authorities, ultimately you know who you're attacking? Get this, everybody. God. In Numbers chapter 12, you have Miriam and Aaron. And it says, they spoke against Moses. The verb there is very interesting. It's in a feminine form. You know why? Because Miriam was the ringleader. But then the Lord hears, and guess who intervenes on Moses' behalf? God does. You need to understand that God is the one who's designed this hierarchy. And if there's one thing I could implore you with all my heart, and I mean this, if there's one thing that I could just say, please get this, understand authority. Get under your right authorities. See, because in Ephesians 6, this is what it says. Children, obey. Here under. Your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with promise, that it might be well with you and that you might live long upon the earth. I get caught into situations. Rebellious children really have upset mom or dad. And I, I look at the young person, I said, do you want to live long? Get under your parents' authority. And that doesn't mean just to please them when they're around, but to please them at all times. And can I tell you all a little secret when you're working with people to find out who's qualified for leadership and who's not? Give them assignments. Give them things to do. Say, this is important to me. This is what I want you to do. And when you see people follow through on it, that's somebody that can be trusted and move forward. When you see people not submitting and not following through, then you know it's probably time to start looking elsewhere. Can I give you the model for some of this? The book of Ruth. Do you remember Ruth? Bad circumstances. Lost her husband. <laughs> Naomi says basically to her daughter-in-law, go home, go back to Moab, serve those gods, let your families there take care of you. Ruth says, no, where you go, I'm going. Your God, my God. She follows. She put herself voluntarily under her mother-in-law, Naomi's, and Naomi says to her in time, you know what, girl, you need security. You need a man. Now, you might say, hey, you might not need security. You don't need a man. But let me just say this. Back in that day and age, it was the man who was the basic provider. And not to be married usually meant to have very difficult times. So she tells Ruth how to get a man. First thing he said, you know what she said first thing? Bathe. I always recommend if you want to get a man, you bathe. Okay, I'm, I'm serious. That's what it says there. And then she told her how to go down to the threshing floor, go down by the feet of Boaz, and wait. Because back in those days, that was the custom. In the way that the woman was to submit to the man and say, okay, you're, you're my kinsman redeemer, I'm coming to you. But why did Ruth have such success? Why is it that in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 11, Boaz says to her, everybody knows you're a virtuous woman. She submitted. She submitted. So don't look at your children and call them out for rebellion until you look in a mirror, okay? It's very, very important, everyone, that we're under authority. And if we're not under authority, we're not pleasing to God. And if we're not pleasing to God, we're opening ourselves up to the wicked one. Have you ever thought about that? See, listen carefully to James 4, verses 6 and 7. God resists the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. See, because it takes humility to humble yourselves. But listen to verse 7. Therefore, submit, arrange yourself under God, and the devil will flee from you. You know why the devil is not fleeing so often? Because we haven't submitted to God because we haven't submitted to his authorities, because we're not arranging ourselves under the ones that God says we need to arrange ourselves under. And we open ourselves up to satanic attack. If you find that you're having unnecessary bouts with the wicked one, I always invite you, see if you're under God's authority. See if you have arranged yourself under the one that you need to be under in all things. And who is our model? Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 5, would you turn here please? Moving over towards the book of Revelation, 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll look at two verses and see if you can help me put this together. 1 Verse 5 says this, likewise you younger people, okay, younger people. It says here, submit. That's a command. It's hupotasso. It's a command for the younger people to submit themselves to their elders. You know who the elders are? The church leaders. The young people need to submit themselves to the church leaders. And then he goes on to say, yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Here's the reason why. God resists the proud. See, he pushes back on the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, don't miss the connection in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under whom? The mighty hand of God. You know how you're humbling yourselves so you're under the mighty hand of God? You're humbling yourselves under the church leadership. See, to get under the authority is to please God. Think of an umbrella. And when it rains and the elements come down, what do you do? You put the umbrella up. When you are under authority, you're under God's umbrella of protection. But when you're not under the umbrella of God's protection, then you're subject to Satan. Say, prove it. All right? Tell me you're from Missouri. Prove it. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There is a man who is an incest. And instead of the Corinthian church disciplining that man, they apparently accepted it. And they must have said, oh, we're a loving lot. We accept all things. That probably sounds very familiar in our culture today. And Paul says, when he heard about the situation, I've made a judgment, although absent from you. When you gather together there with my authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, put him outside the church. Excommunicate him. And essentially, you know what he says? Turn him over to the realm of Satan. Because when the person was put out of the church, out from under his authorities, guess who had access to that individual? Satan. So when you want to be a rebel, and you want to get out from under authority, and you want to ignore the laws of the land, you want to ignore the authorities God has given in a family, and you want to ignore the authorities God has given in a church, you're opening yourselves up the satanic attack. And I want to tell you something. If there's one force in the universe that I do not want to have his foot in my door, it's Satan. We're told not to give place to the devil. I don't want to give him any ground because once he takes that terrain, he's not quick to give it back. And can I tell you honestly, it's always a good place to be under authority. Two teenagers were talking, this story from Jack Moore. <clears throat> and the one said to the other, I'm worried. My dad, he goes out and he works long days. He provides food for our table. He pays the rent. He's putting money aside for my college. And then there's my mom. She stays at home. She washes, she irons, she cooks, she cleans. When I'm sick, she takes care of me. So the second teenager says, what are you worried about? And the first one says that they might try to escape. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you're under authority and you're getting it right, it's the best place on planet Earth to be. And if God gives you an authority for a while that doesn't seem good, 
if you will, like David had with Saul, where Saul was trying to kill him. God was just trying to teach David lessons ultimately. But I'm just telling everybody it's a good place to be when you're under authority. And you don't have a right one day to be in authority unless you have been under authority. And what you do as you're under authority will help to qualify you to be in authority. Does anybody get the picture? Understand the severity of what I'm addressing today? See, after Jesus submits, it very simply says, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Once again, Luke uses the intensifier. She guarded those things that Jesus both said and he did and pondered them. How many of us will be pondering this message on Monday or Friday or next week or next month or next year? Mary kept these things in her heart. She understood it was like Jacob of old. Remember when Joseph had a dream that everyone was bowing down to him? It says in the Greek translation of Genesis 37, 11, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept this matter in mind. Very simply, Jesus yielded to God. He, if you will, saw the yield sign and he slowed down. And you know what God did for Jesus? He yielded to him. Yield in the sense of a crop that is doing well, it produces. Or if you're in finance and your financial investments, they might yield a good return. You got the idea here? See, because in verse 52, it says, and Jesus increased. Do you know how you really make progress in a Christian life, everybody? You get under the right authorities. And the increase here meant continuous action in past time. The concept is to cut forward. Jesus kept making progress. You know why? He was under his God-given authorities, his parents. He was under the ultimate authority of God the Father. And as long as he was under authority, he kept progressing. Are you progressing in your Christian life? Do you know God better? Do you have more answered prayers now than ever? Or is it at some point along the way you go, eh, pick and choose, Main point, this is what I want you to get for today. Yield to God, and God will yield to you. I believe that with all my heart. Yield to God as Jesus yielded to God. The red and the white triangular sign was given to Jesus, and he yielded. But then what did the Father do? He produced or yielded to Jesus because he grew in wisdom. He had the skill to live. His stature increased, and he was in favor not only with God, but also with men. I came upon this in preaching today. The captain of the ship looked into the dark night and saw faint lights in the distance. Immediately, he told his signal man to send a message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly, a return message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was angered. His command had been ignored, so he sent a second message. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain. Soon another message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am seaman third class Jones. Immediately, the captain sent a third message knowing the fear it would evoke. Alter your course 10 degrees south, I am a battleship. Then the reply came, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am a lighthouse. This might sound like a strange signal to you, what I'm telling you today. It cuts against the grain of so much what we see because I know everybody on the highways are ballistic. And all they want to know, if the speed limit is 65, how many miles can I go above 65 and not get a ticket? Okay. And I know families are ballistic today, and they are. And they are. They're more off the hook now than in any time I could ever remember. Husbands are not leading lovingly. Wives are not submitting Biblically, 
Children are at an all-time high wreck level. There are things that are happening in young lives today that never would have been dreamed about 20, 30, 40, even 50 years ago that are now the norms in our society. And I can tell you, it all goes down to one word. Yield. Submit. You begin by submitting to God, and I want you, if you will, to turn to a final passage with me to understand how this works. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I hope, and I mean I, when I say this from the depth of my heart, that if you have rebellion in your life, today you repent. Whether it's dealing with the government and the laws that are given to us, or whether it's the family structure, or whether it's just getting under God's authority so we don't have Satan nipping at our heels. From the depth of my being, I pray that you will deal with your rebellion. And listen to me today, don't put on your deflector shield. You know what that is? The deflector shield is when God strikes you. You just kind of take that baby up and you point it and you let that deflect to someone else. We are all subject to rebellion because of the fall. We are all subject to breaking God's heart because of what we have inherited from Adam. And the way to get this thing right is for all of us, all of us, to get under our God-given authorities. No more lip service. When we know what to do and we've been given governance, when we've been given direction, seriously, we do all of it. Because isn't that what Joseph and Mary did? And did not Jesus increase? I'm afraid we're in a pick and choose society today. That we just simply go, well, I like these five regulations, but I don't like those four. Philippians chapter 2. Here's the command, verse 5. Let this mind, this mindset, this attitude, be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He's our model, is he not? Verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant, Dulu, a slave, left riches to take on rags, to wash feet, to submit to the Father's will, to be butchered on the cross. That's what Jesus submitted to taking the form of a bondservant and coming in like this man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Remember being wrapped with humility and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Is that submission? Following the Father even to death. But now notice the therefore in verse 9. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. See how it works? Jesus yielded to God. And tell me, everybody, what did God do for Jesus? He yielded to him. He blessed his life. He produced for him. Gave him the name that one day all will bow before. Can I ask you today, you know, and I want to be honest with you, I dealt with this at about age 18. 34, 35 years ago. Glad I did. I sat in a seminar, and a man brought up this word, and he talked about authority. And I thought, as an 18-year-old, I'm not under my parents' authority. And I repented of that. And I said, I'm going to get under their authority. I understood even at that age there were certain things in my heart that were not right with God. And I said, God, I'm going to be a man who is going to be under authority. And so when I had a boss, I was under his or her authority. And when I was still living under my parents' roof as a single person, I was under my parents' authority. And when I came to the church here, I got under the leadership's authority. And listen to me. From a clear conscience, I backed my leadership 100%.
You wouldn't hear me taking down the leadership, trying to cause rebellion. And when someone went after my pastor, I want you to understand this, they went after me. Even if there were times I didn't fully appreciate or understand everything that was going on. Because I said, Lord, I'm going to be something loyal. And that's what God's asking you to be to him, loyal. How do you get loyal to God? You get loyal by driving the speed limit. I remember when I dealt with these issues, and it was so freeing because I was like so many other people on a highway, having high blood pressure at age 18, always wondering if a policeman was going to pull me over. It's good to be under authority. And can I tell you now by experience after 30-some years, God gives increase to those who are under authority. Can I ask you today to bow your heads as never before and search your hearts for your own sake, for the sake of your children, for the sake of our church, for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our world, God wants to work through humble people who have submitted themselves, yielded themselves to God's authority. And as everybody's head is bowed and every eye closed, I want to tell you what I believe. The Spirit of God today talked to you. His Word does that. His Word had the ability today to touch each and every heart, whether to say, hey, listen, you are under authority, keep at it. Never move away. Or whether he said to you today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to put your faith in him right now. Can I encourage you if that's you today? You've never gotten under God's authority because you've never believed that Jesus died for your sin and was raised from the dead. Submitting to God's way of salvation, can I encourage you right now? Submit to that by belief. How are you doing with government? Has God spoken to your heart today? Do you have practices going on in your home or practices in the car that are not pleasing to God? Would you confess that to him even right now and say, God, I wasn't under your authority, but I am now, forgive me. How about in your homes, my friends? Children, are you seriously obeying your parents and the Lord? The direction that they have given to you, the things they have requested of you, are you honoring those things? If not, you need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you, and I'd take it a step further. I'd encourage you to go to your mom or your dad and ask their forgiveness because you haven't practiced what you know you should be doing. And you don't want that passed down to the next generation. Wives, how you doing? Submitting to God in everything? Or justifying a partial obedience, which is total disobedience? And men, how are you doing? Husbands, are you under God? Like Joseph and Mary, committed to performing all things, even loving your wife like Christ loved the church?